Um, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Uh, right, picture this. It's 1966, the northern summer, and a corpulent figure in bathing trunks is reclining on a divan in Zhongnan High, the Chinese leadership compound that once formed part of the Imperial Palace in Beijing. A decade and a half earlier, he'd become China's paramount leader by embracing revolution. Learn revolution by making revolution, he famously intoned, and so he did. And it was messy, destructive, and often pitiless. But revolutions are like that after all. They sweep away the established, the outdated, the complacent. In a short space of time, they transform, and things are never quite the same again. So it's 1966, and Mao Zedong is 73 and feeling threatened. He's lying by his pool, reflecting on the numerous occasions in which he's put the spirit of revolution to purpose. The times when he's used it as a central tool of power. The defeat of the Kuomintang, the Great Leap Forward, the Hundred Flowers campaign, and now in the summer of 1966, dejected and slipping slowly into political irrelevance, he deploys it again. But this time as a rolling, ongoing reality. And the great proletariat cultural revolution he unleashes very quickly and very brutally restores his power. But it also all but destroys his country. Oh well, he did warn that uh, it was never going to be a dinner party. Now I often think about Mao and the Cultural Revolution whenever I hear the term digital disruption, because the latter also carries with it a zealous, almost ideological tone. Much as the great helmsman and his devotees saw virtue in permanent revolution, there are many in the business, technology, and particularly the media sector who believe in the transformative power of ongoing disruption. And in its name, companies, organisations, even whole sectors and industries are being turned upside down or swept away. At least that's the way the narrative normally unfolds. But I think the reality is much more complicated than that. So in this presentation, I want to examine some of those complications and take a look at a few examples of the way in which digital disruption is being used not just as a corporate weapon to bludgeon competitors, but as a means to greater engagement. I also want to look at some of the problems around our understanding and use of the term digital disruption, and indeed the broader issue of digital transformation. And then some, then some thoughts on the impact of digital disruption on employment and the role government should play in order to ensure that we as a society and as individuals make the most of the continuing disruption that's certain to occur and which we need to fully embrace. But first, let me start by correcting a popular misconception relating to change and technology. The term digital disruption brings with it a connotation of shock. The idea that industries, individuals and communities sometimes need to be shaken out of their torpor in order to embrace change. We hear quite often in popular discourse the notion that if we want to enact change, that if you want to enact change, you have to make sure that it's well explained because people are innately fearful of it, and correspondingly that too much change unsettles the masses. I heard that exact argument trotted out several times during the recent political ructions in Canberra as the Abbott administration gave way to the Turnbull era. Another thing that we're also regularly told is that the 21st century is a time of dramatic and almost unprecedented change. Well, maybe. But the evidence on all those points, I would suggest, is much overstated. Certainly this is a period of great technological and social movement, but I think if you cast your mind over the great sweep of time, you pretty quickly realise that the story of human existence is one of constant change and development. It's easy to look back on the past as though it was a quieter, slower time. But the truth of the matter is that technology and society have always been on the move. I did a recent show on the demise of handwriting and the emergence of what US author and journalist Clive Thompson calls voice writing. Uh, that is, writing and communicating via dictation and, and transcription software. And one of the interviews I did for that program was with a handwriting specialist and professor of design in the United States called Ewan Clayton. After we'd finished taping and while we were having a bit of a chat, uh, Professor Clayton mentioned to me how his 86-year-old dad had written him a letter every week for the past 47 years. <laughs> 
And what was particularly interesting to me was the way in which Clayton detailed his father's changing relationship with technology over those decades. How his dad had moved from using a fountain pen and scraps of paper four and a half decades ago through to his embrace of an iMac and how that transition had been smooth and relatively problem free. The point is, change is the norm, not the exception in human life. And people have, by and large, like Ewan's dad, adapted to dramatic transformation in a remarkably accepting way. Put simply, using tools to modify, modify our environment and in turn modifying our behaviour as a result is just part of what defines us as human beings. It's the reason why there are so many of us in so many parts of the planet uh, adapting to change uh, just uh, wherever we uh, end up. What this means for the notion of digital disruption and digital transformation is that I think we sometimes worry too much about the pace of change and not enough about the quality of change. Arguably, when people have bucked against developments, it's usually been more about issues of equity and quality rather than nostalgia for the past. I know lots of senior citizens who use tablet computers. I know of no one, young or old, who still uses a typewriter. Certainly change needs to be well explained to people, but if the change is universally good and or perce the perception is that it benefits the quality of someone's life, then people usually get it and they get it pretty quickly. Conversely, if it's not good, if it diminishes their life, or that's the way they perceive it, they tend to get annoyed or to get very angry. Now, while the term digital disruption is a useful one for helping us to understand what's going on in our current world, we have to be careful not to let it obscure the fact that dramatic transformative change often occurs from within, that it isn't always necessarily imposed from outside. Let me give you an example of what I mean. About six years ago, I did a program on the future of museums. This was at a time when there was a lot of concern being expressed by cultural institutions about declining relevancy given the arrival of what were being described as digital competitors. Here are some of the things that I heard during that program. That the museum sector was facing a threat from digital technologies, that audiences could disappear, and finally, that museum staff were conservative and would have to be helped through change. And you could perhaps read helped uh, as a euphemism there for prodded and pushed. Certainly those were prevailing pessimistic but seemingly realistic views at the time. But six or so years later, and that's not at all the way that things have come to pass. Today, some of the most innovative uses of digital technology, I would suggest, are coming from the so-called glam sector. That's galleries, libraries, archives and museums. And one of the really interesting things about that sector is that unlike the traditional news media industry, which has basically embraced the digital world reluctantly as a desperate way of trying to stay relevant, the glam sector has been using digital technologies in a far less defensive way, in fact, in a proactive manner. Earlier this year, I chaired a panel session here in Sydney at the Remix Summit 2015, and my guests included two leading Australian museum directors, Kim McKay from the Australian Museum and Katrina Sedgwick from the Australian Centre for the Moving Image. Now, both Kim and Katrina were very clear about the fact that they were, in effect, self-disrupting their organisations. They didn't use that inelegant description, of course, that was mine, uh, but that was the basic gist of what they were saying. Both of them were actively engaged in rethinking and restructuring their institutions from the ground up in order to maximise the potential they saw from digital technologies. In both cases, they described the digital world as a way of extending reach and relevance, and they talked about the necessity of adopting a digital first approach and not seeing the digital side of what they did as simply an add-on to their traditional means of conducting business. And because of that change of approach in the glam sector, we're now seeing some innovative and very successful initiatives coming to the fore. Initiatives like the National Library's terrific service called Trove, a free online library database aggregator, which now gives people access to hundreds of millions of online resources from all sorts of places. And uh, 
uh, and I can also I can tell you uh, about an on uh, sorry I, know, I can also tell you about an outreach service that the Queensland Museum is currently uh, building, which uses digital tools to connect Indigenous communities and communities in small Pacific nations with the important artefacts that the museum holds in its vast storage vaults. And the idea with that particular project is not just to widen the institution's audience, but to bring Indigenous people into the actual cataloguing and curation process, using their traditional and cultural knowledge to better inform the museum's database and collection. Well, let me give you an example from overseas. The work of leading archaeologist Maurizio Forte in the United States, who I featured recently on my program, who's been reinventing archaeology to bring virtual reality technology to the very centre of his discipline. Not just as a means of enhanced display, but as a way of allowing for greater collaboration between professionals in different parts of the United States and in different regions of the world. Collaboration that allows archaeologists to simultaneously interrogate artefacts and to build on each other's expertise. Again, what I think is interesting in each of these examples is the way disruption is being used as a tool for reorganising and refocusing. And the change that's going on in many parts of the glam sector is root and branch. Change brought on by organisations themselves. Another simple and practical and perhaps unappreciated example of the way in which digital disruption has become a positive force for good is in the area of project funding. Crowdfunding sites like Kickstarter have their problems, they're not a magic panacea, but they have substantially disrupted and transformed the way in which people raise money for projects, inventions and causes. And crucially, they've made the raising of capital more inclusive by facilitating match-ups between those with a project that needs funding and those who want to fund a specific cause. And over the past couple of years on Future Tense, I've featured numerous inventions and new approaches which have benefited directly from a crowd-funded appeal. Everything from smart LED light bulb systems to solar energy generating glass roads to urban recreation areas. So digital disruption has its upsides and it shouldn't, I believe, be seen just as a force imposed on organisations and industries from outside. It can be an empowering thing. But I have to confess that I think the actual term digital disruption suffers from something of an image problem. On the scale of technology buzzwords, it's not quite up there with 3D printing for overuse, but it must come pretty close. Uh, I googled the phrase the other day and 41 million search options suddenly appeared. One of the problems, I think, with the term digital disruption is that it has a bit of a bad boy quality to it, and that's its blessing and its curse. It sounds edgy, unpredictable, rebellious even, and so journalists, PR types, futurists, uh, and those trying to sell business-related products uh, love to deploy it. And they're not particularly choosy about how they deploy it. Depending on the spruker in question, it can sometimes sound like simply systems upgrading, or it can, it can sound like a forthcoming apocalypse. Like Ebola, AIDS, Y2K and Islamic State, it's coming to get us and to take us on a journey to hell. <coughs> Digital disruption, it seems to me, is used as often to scare as it is to describe a state of change or to motivate people to action. And that's probably not surprising, given the sort of combative and aggressive language that's often used when talking about digital disruption. Dig around online just for a bit, and you'll soon find that lots of articles on the subject use words like decimate and penetrate and destructive. And those are the sorts of words we don't normally associate with a process that can be an agent for good. They're the kinds of words usually used to describe the likes of a military invasion. Now, I think that's unfortunate because words, of course, matter. And the wrong choice of terminology can act to limit our understanding of a process that can have huge social and economic impacts. In one sense, it's not the brand that's entirely at fault, that's entirely at fault here. This has been happening in the past, uh, I would suggest, because of the general decline of public discourse over the last 10 years, and uh, just as importantly, the hollowing out of the serious news media. Much of what passes for serious media analysis these days is light indeed, driven more by PR and sensationalism 
than by genuine investigation. There is also a point to be made, I think, that much media coverage of technology and technological development in particular tends to be either superficial, uh, an addiction to the shiny and the new, or it tends to be informed by vested interests. There is also a tendency to use the term digital disruption in a rather simplistic way that pits the new against the old, the sexy against the staid. Now, this is a form of representation particularly beloved of people in the media who like nothing more than black and white scenarios and a good fight. Sure, disruptors might be brash and pushy and contemptuous of regulation, so the narrative goes, but they're new, unstoppable and somehow futuristic simply because they're digital. Conversely, traditional players within a field or market are inevitably painted as tired and old and unable to adjust or adapt. But this is nonsense, of course. Experience should tell us that not all that is new is good and not all that is old is bad. In the field of education, I know that many teachers bemoan the obsession of education departments and politicians with the ideal of the fully digital classroom and technology for its own sake, as though the deployment of gadgets should come before the establishment of educational needs and pedagogical priorities. Where technology and educational imperatives come together best, uh, from what I've seen and, and also been told, is where appropriate digital technology is used to enhance recognised needs or to counter recognised deficiencies, not where classroom practice is twisted and moulded to fit the arrival of new devices. Such simplistic narratives are annoying, but they often, as in the classroom example I've just given, ignore some very important considerations. Let me give you another very topical example of what I mean. Just think about the current stoush between the new poster boy of digital disruption, Uber, and local taxi companies. Now, I have no great personal feelings for either protagonist. I don't dislike traditional taxi companies and the services that they provide, unlike many of my colleagues in the media. Uh, and I clearly see the appeal of Uber's innovative um, share riding or ride booking uh, app. But let's be realistic about this. That particular fight is hardly an equal one. Uber isn't just a sizeable company, it's a beer myth. A California-based multinational backed by venture capitalists with a market valuation of somewhere around 50 billion US dollars. And it uses its huge size, lots of lawyers and large amounts of lobbying and PR to simply flout existing government regulations and eventually wear down competitors and regulators. And it does that all while classifying its drivers as independent contractors so that it doesn't feel the need to provide them with the sorts of work conditions and privileges expected in a country like Australia. Spelt out like that, any thinking and objective observer might well come to the conclusion that digital disruption is not necessarily the path to a better future, but sometimes the return to a dark industrial and corporate past, where big companies do whatever it takes to monopolise an industry and effective regulation becomes all but non-existent. There will always be losers as well as winners whenever there is a massive transformation or disruption. The history of human development is the history of one technology replacing another, of one company replacing another, because it proves more attuned to changing customers need, customer needs and demands. And that's a good thing. After all, connecting to people's changing needs is what, it, what it's all about or what it should be all about. But surely, I would suggest, in an advanced social democracy like Australia, that kind of transformation should occur on a playing field that is as level as possible. Our digital world is already worryingly filled with monopolists like Facebook and Google and Amazon. Organisations that University of Maryland law professor Frank Pasquale evocatively calls the Silicon Valley oligarchs. What a pity one might think if digital disruption simply becomes the window dressing to excuse anti-competitive practice. Real competition, true competition, isn't just the hallmark of good capitalism, it's also meant to be the basis of social democracy.
In 2012, I was asked to give a very, very short graduation speech to students at Deakin University in Victoria. They were communications and technology, technology students, and I was encouraged to leave them with just one thought that might be useful for them as they embarked on their future careers. One thought, which is no easy task for somebody like myself, I have to say. Uh, anyway, the theme that I settled on was curiosity. The world was too full of incurious people, I pontificated. In a digital age where so much information is within our grasp, it is imperative, I said, that we make the most of it, that we don't let, just let algorithms, marketers and PR types dictate what we see, hear and ultimately think. Protect and de develop your sense of curiosity, I declared. Now, if I could have gone to two thoughts, <laughs> I would have also thrown in a line or two about scepticism. I'm still constantly amazed by the number of otherwise intelligent people I meet who have absolutely no idea how a platform like Facebook, for instance, makes its money, or how a company like Google operates. No idea whatsoever. No idea about how such organisations, such corporations, use people's online data to attract advertisers. Absolutely no idea. Many of us are so in love with our gadgets and devices that we forget to ask even the most basic questions about who built them and why and who benefits from the way in which we use them. I talked earlier about a misconception around people's attitudes towards change. I think another misconception that exists in our society concerns trust. No one likes to think of themselves as gullible. Many of us like to think that we're streetwise, that we're wary, that we know when marketers and politicians are trying to manipulate us. But I would argue that that's not necessarily the case. If the digital world proves anything, it proves just how unquestioning and trusting we are of corporations and governments, and for that matter, of well-executed advertising campaigns. How else could anyone explain the actions of millions of people around the world who trusted the Ashley Madison website with the security of their personal information? Much of what is sold to us today about technology and the digital world is coloured by spin and by marketing. There are now many, many more PR specialists in a country like Australia than there are actually journalists. And if you've ever watched The Gruen Transfer on ABC television, you'll know that the marketing and advertising industry isn't just big, it's full of some very, very clever people with very, very doubtful ethics. Skepticism, skepticism should be our watchword. So that when a large digital disruptor like Uber says its business is all about the sharing economy, our healthy sense of skepticism should then kick in and remind us about Uber's $50 billion valuation and also the reality that Uber drivers don't share their cars, they charge people to ride in them. <laughs> or similarly, when we read Facebook's mission statement and it says that the company is dedicated to giving people, quote, the power to share and make the world more open and connected, we might also remind ourselves that Facebook only supports data interoperability with the services or platforms it owns or has a financial arrangement with. Other than that, it's not much into sharing. It's very much a walled garden. Oh, and it's worth remembering that the company's turnover last year, according to Forbes, was around 12 billion US dollars. Now, I don't want to labour the point, but greater public scepticism is a must for ensuring that our dig digital ecosystem remains healthy, equitable and competitive. I want to turn now to the role of government. And I know this is an unpopular thing to say in some quarters, but I am from the ABC. Uh, and I'm one of those people who believe wholeheartedly in regulation and the rule of law. Very old fashioned. Not regulation for its own sake, I hasten to add, not bureaucratic red tape, as it's often called, but properly balanced and directed regulation that allows for individual growth whilst also furthering the social good. One significant factor that's often overlooked in discussions about digital disruption and transformation is the role of government. The central problem with the way in which government in Australia deals with the issue of digital disruption 
is that to date, it seems to have had very little interest in digital issues at all. This is in stark contrast with the United States and many European countries, I would suggest. The very first edition of Future Tense I compiled back in early 2009 dealt with the election of Barack Obama and the plans he and his Confederates had for moving the government of the United States into the digital era. At the time, he was dubbed by many digital analysts as the first ever, quote, internet president, because his campaign the year before had shown, shown how the process of voter mobilisation and campaign fundraising could be revolutionised through clever and coordinated online activity. And, in, and on coming to office, his administration began to put in place at a federal level the sorts of e-democracy measures that had already begun to be undertaken by several innovative state and local governments, most notably the city administration in Washington, D.C. Now, in the time since then, not everything has gone smoothly. But e-democracy, or e-government as it's also called, is still considered an important direction for US government departments to support and undertake. And agencies like the State Department have been involved in staff exchanges with large technology companies and with institutions like MIT. In Australia, by contrast, over roughly the same period of time, the governments of Kevin Rudd, Julia Gillard and Tony Abbott collectively showed very little interest in any matters relating to science and technology, let alone the digital domain. You might recall that during Julia Gillard's tenure, the then chief scientist, Professor Penny Sackett, resigned in protest halfway through her five-year term, revealing that in all that time, she had never managed to secure a personal meeting with the Prime Minister, and that prior to that, she had only ever been called upon to provide a briefing to Gillard's predecessor, Kevin Rudd, on just one occasion, just one. But worse was to come. When Tony Abbott took the reins of government in 2013, his first ministry, of course, contained no minister for science at all. They simply forgot to include one. After an outcry from the science community, this was later corrected and the word science was tacked onto the Minister for Industries letterhead. But it was done as an afterthought and only after pro uh, protest. Specifically on the issue of the digital world and the digital economy, so few politicians during the Rudd, Gillard and Abbott years showed any genuine interest in digital affairs that it's possible to count them on one hand. And by my accounting, they were Lindsay Tanner, Scott Ludlam, Kate Ellis and Malcolm Turnbull. And I'll come back to Malcolm Turnbull in just a minute. In fact, the only digital initiatives that our politicians have really become exercised about in recent years have been data retention laws and mandating a digital filter for the internet. Now that's perhaps an exaggeration, but I think you get my point. How, however, all of what I've just said shouldn't be interpreted as suggesting, suggesting that there's been a corresponding lack of interest in digital disruption and transformation within the ranks of the public service, because that's just not the case. There are, I know, many frustrated public servants who have for years been trying in vain to push matters digital further up the federal government's priority list. And Australia does now have a digital transformation office and there are regular event, events like the Governate Summit uh, for those keen to explore digital opportunities and challenges. But on any fair assessment, our national interest in matters digital has been lacklustre indeed. What's also been a concern for many has been the way in which the rolling out of a national broadband network has been plagued by political infighting and intrigue. Which brings me back to Malcolm Turnbull. Turnbull is a great user of digital technologies, famously. But as communications minister until two weeks ago, he also had his fair share of critics. One on online article I came across last week screamed, quote, Malcolm Turnbull was Australia's worst ever communications minister. Which if true, and I'm not saying it is, would certainly make him an achiever. Because there's... <laughs> There's definitely been plenty of competition for that title in recent decades. <laughs> I used to host the media report before I, um, I began hosting Future Tense. As we know, the member for Wentworth is now Prime Minister, of course. So what can we expect from his government with regard to digital transformation? Well, only time will tell, as they say, but it's interesting to note 
that in his first media statement after winning the Liberal Party leadership and becoming Prime Minister-elect, Malcolm Turnbull made the following comment, and this was in his first media, uh, first media statement. The quote is, The Australia of the future has to be a nation that is agile, that is innovative, that is creative. We cannot be defensive, we cannot future-proof ourselves. We have to recognise that the disruption that we see, driven by technology, the volatility and change is our friend. Is our friend if we are agile and smart enough to take advantage of it. So leaving politics to the side, at least we now have a recognition from the top that these things are important and that our thinking and strategising about the digital future must start at the very highest levels. And I'm sure many people were pleased to hear this week that one of the priorities for the new Turnbull government in Canberra with regards to matters digital will be to review support of the supportive framework around the development of Australian startups. But as I said, only time will tell. Only time will tell how well the new government's innovation and science and technology team, which is quite large, uh, including Malcolm Turnbull himself, Christopher Pine, Kelly O'Dwyer, Mitch Fifield and Wyatt Roy, only time will tell whether they'll match the rhetoric with reality. It was also pleasing to see yesterday that the Labor opposition has now seen the wisdom of providing greater support and emphasis to the start-up community. But as one of my colleagues said to me on Wednesday, let's just hope that both political parties don't become fixated on startups as the only form of digital innovation. Now the gold standard for digital innovation at a national level is Estonia, a small central European country that has taken a digital first approach to everything it does. Not every country can or would want to follow in Estonia's footsteps. The size of its population and geography give it unique conditions. But the digital first way of thinking that Estonians have embraced as a nation is perhaps something that could be emulated here in Australia. Getting the mindset right, I would argue, is always a necessary pre precursor for successful change. So the role of government in the age of digital disruption can be about leading transformation through example and encouragement, but it should also be about ensuring checks and balances. And again, I make an argument here for the deployment of healthy scepticism. How, for instance, does it help a nation like Australia if digital disruption, disruption simply leads to the diminishment of competition? In that regard, we have to be careful not to see digital disruption as an end in itself, to allow it to become a justification for the growth of a winner-takes-all corporate environment. Uber should be allowed to compete in the Australian marketplace and by all means let government change the regulatory structures in response to its entry. But they should be changed for the entire taxi industry to make it a level playing field, not one that significantly advantages a digital disruptor over an established operator. Secondly, we need to properly acknowledge the monopolistic tendencies of many existing digital disruptors and actively counter them. Facebook, Google, Amazon, they all dominate their areas of interest in a way that was once, once thought of as unhealthy. In Europe, such dominance is viewed with concern by regulators, but in Australia, we largely seem to have followed the hands-off approach adopted by the United States. As anyone who regularly shops for groceries in this country can attest, the dominance of one or two players in a field doesn't always lead to lower prices and better services. In fact, often quite the contrary. On top of that, experience suggests that duopolistic or monopolistic control of a sector can sometimes hinder a company or organisation's ability to be responsive to new disruptions and the need for change. And using the supermarket business in Australia as an example, it's been pointed out by uh, various economists and retail analysts that the duopoly enjoyed by Woolworths and Coles actually blinded them to the arrival of the online shopping trend and the threats and both, both the threats and benefits presented by that change. We also need to be more realistic, I think, about the extent to which Australian innovators can compete in a world increasingly dominated by Frank Pasquale's Silicon Valley oligarchs. The notion that anyone with a good business idea and a little bit of backing can suddenly build a world-beating digital platform needs to be treated with caution. The sheer size of US operators and their access to large amounts of capital will always be an impediment to local companies trying to make good in a digital world 
that is constrained by far fewer national boundaries. Competition with international competitors has long been an issue for Australian businesses, but in the less regulated digital sphere, establishing a foothold or holding the ground that you have can prove even more difficult. A case in point is the very successful Australian hotel booking platform, What If? What If started its life 15 years ago as a digital disruptor, <coughs> and it grew fast while its competition remained largely local. But in 2014, the company's owners effectively threw in the towel and sold the business to Expedia. Because once the big international players got seriously interested in winning over Australian customers, the game for a much smaller domestic operator like What If was all but over. How we as a middle-sized nation address that problem in the future, I'm not entirely sure. But I know that we first have to acknowledge that that problem actually exists. For my money, perhaps the most significant future issue that governments and societies will have to address around the continuing digital transformation of our world concerns what to do to ensure high levels of employment. Disruptive technologies have always cost some people their jobs. The history of technological disruption, since well before the Industrial Revolution, has been one of job loss followed by the creation of new opportunities and new occupations. When one door closes, a window opens, that kind of thing. For many years now, that's been the accepted wisdom about technological change in the workplace. And by and large, that's been true. And we've been telling ourselves that scenario now for so long that it has almost a reassuring sense of inevitability about it. But in the last couple of years, we've seen the emergence of credible research into the employment impacts of automation that are worrying indeed. Research from Oxford University published in late 2013 suggested that up to 40% of current US jobs would be automated away in a few short years. While well-known US economist Tyler Cowen predicts the hollowing out of the middle class in the United States as the result of a combination of both automation and the outsourcing of American jobs offshore. Now, when I interviewed uh, both of those people, Professor, when I interviewed them for my program, both Professor uh, Cowan and Oxford University's Michael Osborne, who's an Australian, by the way, used the old jobs for new jobs argument to give their otherwise gloomy message at least some positive dimension though they both readily conceded that they had no real idea where those new jobs would come from and what they would be. But what if things are different this time around? Just because new jobs have been created in the past doesn't of itself mean that substantial amounts of new employment will be created in the future as a result of digital disruption and transformation. In the modern world, when, when companies automate, they do so not just to improve inefficiencies, oh, sorry, improve efficiencies for customers, but to drive down their operational costs. And wages are a major expense for any organisation or company, as we know. Does anyone really believe that when Kmart and Woolies decide or decided to automate their checkouts, that they were doing so in order to create new jobs elsewhere? That would simply be naive, or at best, a wishful way of thinking. Similarly, when banks and insurance organisations closed branches and moved their businesses online in recent years, they weren't at the same time thinking of ways to increase employment opportunities. The whole idea was about saving on wages and building costs. I think we need to be far more realistic about the unique nature of digital disruption when it comes to employment. Digital operations decrease employment. When you think about it, giant digital companies like Facebook, Google and Amazon have far fewer people working for them than comparable sized non-digital companies in previous decades. Far fewer. I've talked a lot about Uber during this presentation and I don't mean to uh, always single them out, but even Uber announced recently that like Google, they've decided to invest in the further development of driverless car technology. So even Uber has a long-term ambition to get rid of its human employees. For governments, whether they like it or not, addressing the employment impact of exponential automation is going to be a real issue as the middle class shrinks and the standard of living of ordinary people continues to fall. And it has been falling, as we know, even in rich nations like the United States and Great Britain. In such a situation, the setting of government-imposed limits on automation simply can't be ruled out in the future. 
That may sound undesirable to us today, but in order to avoid the sort of social chaos that we know can arise from mass unemployment, greater impositions and controls on the digital world may well be demanded by a frightened and angry populace, particularly if inequality continues to rise in Western societies. And just finally, if we're talking about digital disruption for good, for the good of society as a whole, not just certain rich individuals, uh, then I think it's imperative that we be mindful of the sort of anti-government, anti-regulation rhetoric that is a feature of the digital world. It is right that in a liberal democracy, we should always be vigilant about the role of government in our lives in, and in our businesses. But there is a tendency among digital operators to view regulation, regulation simply as an impediment. One of the hallmarks of the digital world is that it had its birth in the countercultural movement of the 1960s and 70s. And that was a plus. It gave an innovative and rebellious streak to digital developments in the 80s, 90s, and early years of the century. But the digital world is now more corporate than it is countercultural. And attacks on regulators by the likes of Facebook, Amazon, and Airbnb often have a worrying tendency toward naked self interest at best, and at worst, an almost Tea Party-esque quality, neither of which I would maintain are positive forces in an equitable society. In summary then, and before I open to questions, let me just run through the main points of this presentation. The eight take-home messages, if you like, and they are. We need to stop uh, selling people short when we talk about attitudes to change and acknowledge that the default option for most people is the embrace of change, not its rejection. We need to recognise and acknowledge that organisations are not always victims of disruption, but that a disruptive approach can be employed by an organisation itself to refocus and drive growth. We need to be careful of the negative combative aspects of the term digital disruption, avoid the simplistic new versus old narrative, be sceptical and appropriately questioning of the motives and statements of digital disruptors to ensure that the term doesn't simply become window dressing for anti-competitive practice, make sure that our politicians and leaders realise that strategising about our digital future needs to be led from the top if we are to make the most of the opportunities presented. Ensure that the role of government in the age of digital disruption not only leads transformation through example and encouragement, but also ensures appropriate checks and balances. Keep watch on the impact of digital transformation to ensure that it doesn't simply lead to higher unemployment and greater inequity. And finally, be mindful that the rhetoric we employ around the online world and digital disruption remains inclusive and that it isn't simply hijacked by vested interests and those exposing extreme anti-government, anti-regulation views. <coughs> I began with Mao Zedong and his famous quote about the power of revolution, and let me just end by paraphrasing a more subtle and familiar Chinese pro proverb. May you be cursed to live in interesting times. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. <coughs> Thank you, Anthony. I'll just join you up here. Uh, so we have time for a few questions, about five minutes, and I think that curiosity and scepticism is a good platform for that. So do we have anyone who would like the microphone to ask Anthony a question? We're also looking to Twitter, so if you have tweeted a question, we'll throw it. Yes, James, microphone for you. I have to say that was just an excellent keynote presentation, so thank you very much. Thank you, James. Um, <laughs> My question, um, you mentioned one of the things I am actually quite obsessed with, which is this um, issue of self-service in, in supermarkets and other similar situations. And you talk about the, the motivations and that actually reduces jobs. I, I've found it interesting that on the, on the sort of converse side, there are stories of self-service chaos making people buy more, and that kind of leads to more consumption, which leads to more, to more jobs. I, I guess wonder whether you have any thoughts around those sort of unexpected consequences of, of automation. 
Does it lead to more jobs, though? I mean, it might lead to more Woolies being built, but they'll just be built <laughs> with uh, more automated checkouts. Uh, I, I find it interesting. It must be... I think it's telling that Woolworths has started a campaign with leading celebrities, Australian celebrities, about their time working as kids in supermarkets. Uh, and they've started that campaign just at the time when you're really noticing uh, the automation of the, uh, the checkout facilities. Uh, that in itself, I think, is telling. I, I mean, I, don't, I think it is one of those either-or, and having caution against journalists taking a black-and-white approach to life. I think it's not always the case that it leads to, uh, to lower levels of employment, but I think, by and large, it does... Um, simply because that's what it's intended to do. I mean, we would have got rid of a whole lot of jobs on assembly lines in the past if our automation had been better. We're now at a point, and this I think is one of the things that we often don't realise, we're now at the point where our automation and um, uh, the intelligence, or, uh, intelligence of our, our systems, the systems that we built, is now so good uh, that it is doing away with people in, in a, a big way, even, even the sort of periphery people in factories and things like that. Foxconn um, makes all the Apple computers. It has uh, a stated aim of getting rid of all of its employees, of completely roboticising its entire operation. I think, I could be wrong about this, but I think it's 20, by 2020. That might be not the time, but I know they've got a stated, uh, a stated aim to do that. Thank you, James. Matt, over there, we have another question from... So thank you, Anthony. Very thorough presentation. Um, question for you. So as a journalist, and therefore as a participant in an industry that's kind of been sort of nuked, for want of a better verb, over the last t 10 to 15 years, in terms of your personal experience, are there any lessons from that in terms of how you cope with disruption, what you do, or what you don't do? Um, I think what you don't do is panic. And I think if you look at the news media industry, the organisations that panicked about 10 years ago, um, and I can give you, I'll give you two examples of magazines. One of them that panicked was Time magazine, and it almost overnight, if you remember, changed its whole format. It, it changed its, ma its, its paper copy of its magazine uh, to try and make it look a bit more uh, like a, a website. And it was just appalling. And they introduced things like... Uh, you know, um, random figures, you know, a column that just had random figures, you know, 29 is the number of taxis that passed, uh, you know, passes the, you know, Empire State Building in every five seconds in New York, just these random factoids. But so they started doing all of that kind of stuff and going down market on their website to try and compete with uh, what they saw as the disruptors who were, you know, light, basically... Um, entertainment style websites and it was a big failure for them. Conversely, The Economist decided to stick with its guns on its uh, printed version of its, of its um, publication and to not only match it in terms of quality online but to uh, not be tied to its printed version, to be innovative in what it could do online and The Economist has gone great guns over the last 10 or so years, expanding into America um, and has still managed to keep its integrity. So if you're interested in serious news, The Economist still provides serious news whether you go online or you read its magazine version. Um, we're in Sydney. That's not necessarily the case with the Sydney Morning Herald. I sat down for breakfast this morning and was, I was reminded again, because I don't read paper papers anymore, I was reminded again of what good quality journalism there is in the Sydney Morning Herald. You won't find it on the Sydney Morning Herald website or you'll have to really, really go searching for it. So I think the, the, the big thing is not to panic, but also just to know what you want to do and also to identify what your competitors are. I think one of the problems for the news media industry is that we, are, we, we see ourselves, we are competing in a sense with all types of websites, but we've lost our focus on what we do. And we confuse, now I hear journalists all the time at the ABC talking about uh, competitors like BuzzFeed. Well, I'm sorry, BuzzFeed might have employed a couple of journalists, a couple of high-name journalists, but that's all. That's literally all they've done. They've got a couple in the States and they've got a couple here. You know, Crikey has more, uh, has more journalists in Australia than BuzzFeed has. And BuzzFeed's not a, a, a news organisation. 
It's an entertainment organisation that employs a couple of journalists and prints a couple of serious stories. Um, so we shouldn't confuse the two. I don't think there is anything wrong with BuzzFeed. I think it's great. It's entertainment. But in the olden days, we didn't say, the ABC News didn't say it was compete, you know, its main competitor was Who Weekly. Um, we, we seem to now mistake who our competitors are. And that's a problem because if you're designing strategies, there's a danger, and I'm not saying we do this at the ABC, but there's a danger that you design the strategy against a competitor who you really shouldn't see as a competitor at all. Great, and maybe one final question over here. Sorry, what's your name? Alex. Alex, thank you. Thank you. You mentioned Estonia as, as a digital disruption country, effectively, and I wanted to know your take. A country that um, was in an era of fear and, and oppression managed to transform completely to embrace digital I identities, share all of the information with government and trust government to, to make best use of that. What, what hopes have you got for Australia to, to follow in those kind of footsteps? Not a great deal, to be honest. And <laughs> I know that sounds pessimistic, but I think worryingly over the last five, ten years, we've really, as I said in the presentation, we, we have really swallowed uh, the kind of anti-government rhetoric that was, uh, that's, that's populated uh, the United States and uh, for, for so long. Um, that's becoming a feature of our politics on both sides of the political divide. It's not just the, the conservative side. So I think that mitigates against it. Uh, you know, in, in the United States, um, anybody who's been to the United States recently would just know that services, like basic services, like the roads, <laughs> are falling apart. Uh, lighting, all of that kind of stuff. So uh, in that, and, and, and all because of this kind of anti-government rhetoric, anti-taxation rhetoric. And I think uh, if you've got that, it limits, if you've got that kind of rhetoric, that's all well and fine as an ideology, but it limits your ability to be creative. Um, and so the development of that kind of rhetoric, I think, limits our ability to do, um, to do what we perhaps need to do in, in the digital world. I, I mean, I, I used to cover politics. I'm enormously sceptical of all politicians. And, I, you know, it was interesting timing that Labor came out yesterday with its statements about startups immediately after Wyatt Roy got a whole lot of uh, media attention about startups. Uh, so you can be sceptical of the motivations there, but I mean it has to be a good thing. Just that we're having that kind of discussion at least has to be a good thing. So if the politicians at least are forced to recognise that there is an issue, as long as we can avoid that kind of uh, anti-big government rhetoric, um, you know, th there's a possibility I think of us doing much, much better than we've done. But it's a very low bar, isn't it, I think at the moment. So, you know, it'd be easy to jump that one. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Anthony, for this very thought-provoking talk. You've given us plenty of food for thought, which we can now also join in with some morning tea and continue to digest. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you.